want to start by welcoming you and thanking you for uh, listening to this month's audio CD. Uh, today is January 10th, 2010. Uh, for you th- who do not know me, my name is Dr. Mike Bucknell of South Alabama Chiropractic in Mobile, Alabama. My website is www.maximizedlivingdrbucknell.com. And uh, the purpose of the audio workshops is really to, uh, you know, move into the next century in communication, get the information in a format where we can reach more people, we can get it out over the internet, over the web, uh, you can listen to it in your car, share audios with your friends and family members, and we're not locked down to just uh, time that we're in office, but we can really just, uh, it, it can be an ongoing uh, ongoing education and empowerment sessions so that you can really get the most out of your uh, your health and wellness that you possibly can. So today's topic is going to be resolution to revolution. What do we do? Here it is January 10th and uh, you know we're, we're into a new year, not just a new year but a new decade. And what can you do to really get your goals off on the next level or for the you know for many of us, a lot of us listening, uh, it's it's making them actually happen at all for the first time. So, you know, we, we look at your New Year's resolutions, and I'll, I want to ask you just first and foremost, do you have New Year's resolutions? Did did this year, did you actually set up a clear resolution? Uh, what exactly is that resolution? Do, you know, can you think of something right now that you planned on doing at the beginning of the year that uh, as that ball was falling and you were uh, holding your sweetheart and you know and everything else that that goes on that night you're you're thinking well this is going to be a great year and this is what what I'm going to make happen so what exactly was that resolution that you set for yourself I want you to get that crystal clear in your head right now now when I say crystal clear I'm asking really how clear was it Uh, how specific was it Uh, did, did you know all the details did you know exactly what it looked like uh, also, how attainable did you view it as? Did it look like something that, that you could really attain or was it just uh, something that you were kind of like, well, you know, I, I hope that I can uh, achieve it, but, but I don't really know exactly how attainable it is. Uh, the next question, are you still following through? Uh, have, you, have you really continued to follow through on that goal? Uh, Pablo Picasso said, Our goals can only be reached through a vehicle of a plan in which we must fervently believe and upon which we must uh, vigorously act. There is no other route to success. You know, so I know for a lot of people, even by, uh, you know, February 1st, maybe even by January 10th, we've already lost sight of those resolutions or have already determined that, that we have failed. You know, so I want to take a minute to talk about why we fail in those resolutions. You know, for, first thing, did you really want it and why? Uh, what, what exactly what was your goal? You know, uh, probably the most common goal at the beginning of the year is to get in shape and to lose weight. You know, you and most of that is because we totally didn't take care of ourselves during Christmas and during New Year's and the holidays, and so now we're trying to make up for it. You know, but did you really want it? You know, you, you can see a lot of people initially think that they want it because, you know, of course, gym memberships go through the roof and, and diet and exercise books, uh, you know, get uh, swallowed up off the shelves at the beginning of the year. But ultimately, it still comes down to did you really want it? And, you know, so your goal specifically, did you want it? Why did you want it? Is that really clear? Can you answer that even right now? Uh, is it is it something lasting or is it was it just something superficial? Uh, second, secondly, did you believe you could? You know, I think that's a, a really important question for a lot of people because they they just don't really think that they can or that they ever could really achieve that goal. It was something that they thought was out of sight. So you know, we kind of psych ourselves up a little bit and be like, oh yeah, that, you know, that would be great if this would happen. And and yeah, we're gonna do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but then uh, they're they're like the the guy that's uh, looking out over the over the edge of an airplane, getting ready to parachute out, and you know they got the bag on their back, and they're they were all psyched up on the way up, and now that they're looking down, they're saying, oh, you know what? I think I'm just gonna hang out here in the plane where it's safe. You know, and then uh, lastly, did you ever really commit to it? Did you ever commit yourself to achieving that goal? 
And that, you know, it, it kind of goes on the same lines with the airplane analogy because, you know, a lot of people, they think that they commit to it when they put the parachute on their back, when they get their jumpsuit on, when they pay for the airplane to take them up, when they're standing there in the aircraft and they're talking about what's going to happen or when they were taking the lessons, you know, they, they thought that that was commitment. But you see, it's not really commitment until they jump. You know, until they actually do what they set forth to do, you know, you really can't say that that person was ever committed to it. So I want to talk about the psychology of commitment and what that really means. So the ladder of commitment, this, this is a real good way for you to look at it, you know, as, is if you've got a ladder and every time that you stay committed to something, you're either stepping up or when you break that commitment, you're stepping down. You know, unfortunately for what I see with, with a lot of people, is that as they're as they're making small steps up that ladder then they break a commitment and they basically fall back five or six steps or maybe even more or completely tumble off the ladder they just let themselves fall off completely and and don't bother to climb back up you know so you got to look at commitment kind of on that same level that every single time that you uh, every time that you stick to that commitment, you work through an, an, an objection or uh, an adversity that you're making another small step up that ladder, uh, but also you uh, tend to fall back down if, if you break that. You know, but, and the important thing to know there is every time that you fail, you are losing power. Uh, Martin Luther King said, a nation or civilization that continues to produce soft-minded men purchases its own spiritual death on the installment plan. You know, that basically every, you know, we, we let ourselves be soft-minded, that, that we, uh, we allow ourselves to fail and we, we just become comfortable and complacent in that place of of limited power and low self-esteem you know so it gets to the point where you have to ask your question do you really trust yourself anymore you know is it can can you trust that you're gonna follow through when you look at yourself in the mirror and some people can't even look themselves in the mirror but you know you you look yourself in the mirror can i trust you that you are gonna stick to your commitments i mean when, when you look at your spouse you know you you want to look at them and know that you can look them right in the face and say, I trust in you. Or when your children are, are telling you something, you know, I've, I've got a five year old and, you know, so Jalen, he'll, uh, you know, he'll do something that I, I want to know that I can look at him and say, Jalen, tell me the truth, you know, in, in what just happened and be able to know that you trust in that person. But honestly, can we really look at ourselves and know that we can trust in ourselves to follow through on the big commitments and the big objectives in our lives. And, uh, you know, so, so when you can't trust yourself, you, you gotta ask, can you really believe in yourself anymore? You know, it, it goes hand in hand. So I wanna talk about the power of discipline, you know, because this is really what it all boils down to. And, and ultimately in 2010, this is going to be the thing that is gonna make or break your changes this year. It's all about discipline. You see everywhere that, that discipline is really the biggest thing that people are lacking these days. And the, the means of why our, our, honestly, our country has kind of fallen to pieces is because discipline is worse than it's probably ever been before. You know, so it, you, you understand it takes discipline to create habits. Okay. So your bad habits were created through discipline. You know, every single time that you, you have, uh, some kind of a bad habit that, that you know you don't want there, you've got to realize that, that you discipline yourself into that. You know, I'll give you an example. You, you look at somebody that is a, that's a smoker. You know, if you smoke, you, you know, it, it probably the first time that you took a cigarette, it was not a fun thing. You know, it wasn't like you, you inhaled and oh man, that was, that was wonderful. That was great. Or, you know, I remember the first time, uh, drinking alcohol. It, I mean, it, it doesn't taste good. It wasn't something that you were like, oh boy, I can't wait to do that again. You know, especially, uh, you know, uh, beer drinkers. You know, you can, you can probably remember the last time that, or the, uh, first time that your dad gave you a beer. You know, so, but it was working through discipline to lay in that as a habit. So you did it enough times that eventually it just, you know, it did become a habit and you began to accept it. 
Abraham Maslow, he said, if you deliberately plan on being less than you are capable of being, then I warn you that you'll be unhappy for the rest of your life. So, you know, most of us need to realize right now that we've deliberately planned on being less than what we're capable of being. It, you know, you may not see it as a conscious decision, but that's just really the truth is, is we planned it in our lack of planning. We planned it in our acceptance of less than commitment, of less than discipline. We've accepted everything that we've allowed to happen to us. So the good news there is that bad habits can be only be uh, undone through discipline also. Uh, well, I guess I can't really say that's, that's good news, but, but, you know, it should be looked at good news is that you can undo those bad habits, but it takes discipline to do that. You know, if, if, again, going back to the smoker, you know, uh, it usually isn't just as simple as, well, I'm just not going to smoke anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and put it down. You know, you'd agree it, it usually takes a degree of discipline to work through those times where you have the, uh, the craving and, and you start thinking about it. And you have to have the mental integrity to push yourself through that and know that you can trust yourself and you believe in yourself enough that you can say, you know what? No, I'm better than this. I can do it. I'm not going to pick it up again. So on that note, good habits can also be created through discipline. So think of one that you've done uh, up until this point, you know, some kind of a good habit, uh, such as brushing your teeth. You know, I'm sure you can come up with something more, more of valor than brushing your teeth, but you know, we'll, we'll just look at something simple. You know, it, again, it wasn't necessarily fun to take out two minutes every single day, you know, uh, in the morning and at night in order to brush your teeth. But you com you continued through that discipline doing it over and over and over again until it became a habit. And now, you know, you, you most likely don't even think about brushing your teeth. It's just what you do. You get up, you pick up your toothbrush, use the restroom. It's just part of the routine. So those good habits can really be created anywhere that you want them to through that same level of discipline and commitment. Now, you know, the, uh, the other question that people have is, well, do I really have what it takes? You know, and I, I want you to, uh, I want to give you an example just in, in my past, uh, when I was in chiropractic school, actually before chiropractic school, I was, uh, one of my prerequisites was biochemistry. And as a uh, young student, you know, in, in uh, just out of undergrad, I was, you know, I was taking this class and I, I really just didn't understand what biochemistry had to do with chiropractic because I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be adjusting people. I don't necessarily need to know exactly how the Krebs cycle and, and all this other stuff works. And honestly, I can tell you, I, I probably don't really remember a whole lot of what we learned in that class, though. You know, if, if I see it, I can quickly refresh. But, but nonetheless, you know, I was taking this class and, and it just really was not interesting to me at all. And, uh, if, if there was anything that you can say about me, it's, uh, it's ADD. You know, that if, uh, if it's not something I'm interested in, I'm very quick to lose my focus, lose my attention and, uh, move on to something else. So, you know, I take this class and, and because of that, I'm not doing so well. And it came down to, in order to be accepted into chiropractic school, you had to get a particular grade. Uh, like, you, you know, you, I essentially what it boiled down to, I needed to have an A on this test, on this final exam, in order to get my acceptance into chiropractic school. So here I am, you know, looking at all the details and, and what, it, what needs to be done. And I just got this, uh, this thought in my head that, I will do whatever it takes. You know that I will not be defeated. I'm not going to let this uh, beat out my entire future and what I'm in the lives that I'm able to touch and save now. You know, so it was just whatever it takes. Failure is not an option. And sure enough, you know, I passed the test, and the rest is history from there. So I want you to think of an example in your past right now. You know where where that's happened, and you can look back and say, you know what. I did work through that area of my life, and if I can work through that, then I can work through these little tiny commitments, these little tiny disciplines that really are not hard to do at all. You know, and if, if, if you lock onto that and you just remember those times, it's going to make it a lot easier.
So how to lock in on a goal. I want, I want to go through just a, a, a few steps with you on how to make a goal relevant and how to really make it work for you. So step one is make it crystal clear. Napoleon Hill said, reduce your plan to writing. The moment you complete lit this, you will have definitely given concrete form to the, to the intangible desire. Okay. Again, reduce your plan to writing. The moment you complete this, you will have definitely given concrete form to the intangible desire. You know, so you, you have a thought in your head which is basically intangible. You can't see it. Uh, but when you write it down on paper, now you can see it. It becomes real. You know, another powerful means of going about this in at home actually right behind me as I'm recording this right now is my what I call my vision board you know so I've got a vision board uh, where I keep all of my goals I keep all of my uh, desires and wishes and, and everything that I want to accomplish on this on this board so that every single day I can look at it and know exactly what I'm working towards so you know it doesn't matter what it is you know if it's a business goal or a personal goal or you know even if it's uh, some you know some product or or a, you know a piece of equipment or electronics or you know something that you want you can you can put it up on there and you see that picture of it every day instead of it being a a far distant thought, you know, you're actually able to look at it and it maintains your focus. So that's part of the second uh, second detail is making it real. Uh, Napoleon Hill also said, any idea, plan, or purpose may be placed in the mind through repetition of thought. You know, so you don't just write it on paper and then never look at it again. You have to make it real. And the only way that you do that is you not only continue to look at that goal and continue to review it regularly, but you actually image it. You, you imagine it. You, you put yourself in that position. You know, you think about what will it be like? What, what will my life be like? If, you know, let's say that, um, you're, you're driving a beater. Uh, car and you want you want to buy a new uh, a new car of whatever kind you know and you you know what the color is you know what kind of features you want in that car you know everything that you want about that car and so you you've got your picture on there but you never look at it again see so you've got to get the picture on there look at it but then also sit down and visualize sit down and um, you know and think about yourself driving the car if if it's weight loss is your goal think about you know, being out on the beach, wearing the bathing suit that you want, you know, getting the whistles as you're walking down, whatever it is that floats your boat, you know, just knowing that, that you can visualize that and actually imagine yourself in that place. And that's going to help drive you towards that goal. Now, does it matter if you think it's attainable? This, this is a really valid question. You know, some people, they, they look at it and they say, well, you know, I just, I don't know that that's attainable. And you want to keep it to the level to where you can believe it. But I also want to urge you to be careful with that because what you think is non-attainable, I, I really, in my, in my heart, I think God doesn't think is unattainable. You know, that, uh, your, your wants and desires would not be placed in your heart if it was not able to be accomplished. You know, so you, you know, it, I, I have a lot of high reaching goals, you know, to, uh, change healthcare in the entire city of Mobile, if not the entire state and, uh, transfer on beyond that and be able to, uh, coach and lead other doctors and chiropractors to, you know, be able to treat their patients according to their health and not according to their symptoms. And, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of these far reaching goals that if I were to sit back and think, oh my goodness, you know, how in the world am I going to be able to accomplish this? I'd probably get really overwhelmed, but I don't think about those details because I know that that was placed in my heart. So if it's there, it's there with a means that those means eventually are going to, you know, come into action. So I just, I just don't question that. So don't, be too considerate about if you think it's attainable or not. Uh, next thing, step outside your perceived limitations. You know, and this, this kind of goes on those same lines there. That if you have a limitation, let's say you're trying to lose weight and you're like, well, I know I need to exercise, but I've got this bad need, the, uh, this, this bad knee. So, uh, you know, the, the good news there is you've got a good knee. You know, you, if, if you got one bad knee, you've also got another good knee. You know, but, 
the the point is step outside of your perceived limitations think about what you can accomplish what can you do yeah you may not be able to run on the sidewalk but you might be able to do a bike you might be able to do something you know something on that level you know so you've got to look outside of your limitations don't let those win over you you know i see too many people all the time who just come up with excuse after excuse after excuse not to do this not to do that not to you know they whether it's their time or i don't have the money or or you know i i've got this health problem or yeah but i've got this disease yeah but i'm taking this medication i mean it doesn't matter what it is the bottom line is if you let those things limit you it's nothing more than and then an excuse and excuses is, is a lie wrapped in a skin of truth that's it period do not let your excuses limit you anymore so the next step commit yourself to the point of trust you know so you, you've got to commit yourself to the point where you know you can look yourself in the mirror and say I will do this and you actually trust yourself that goes back to belief but but can you look at yourself and trust that you are going to do this until you're doing that you're not really committed you get that if if you don't trust yourself to any degree then you're really not committed so you need to figure out what it takes to get you committed to that level um, the next step, once you've made that commitment to yourself, it makes it a lot easier if you make it public. If you actually tell other people that you also trust and you know that are going to help hold you to that commitment. Uh, for example, and I'll throw it out here just to make it even more public, you know, is I, I have a commitment to run my first marathon that, uh, you know, despite any any holdups and lack of training or anything like that that I'm not going to let that win over me that one way or another if I have to limp across the finish line if I tear an ACL it doesn't matter what it is I am going to win my I'm, I'm gonna not win I'm not I'm not looking to win but I'm going to run my first marathon you know so here it is that's public now you can all hold me to it so that's what I'm talking about make it public make it to where other people know that you're gonna do it Next thing, lock in by burning every single bridge and safeguard that you can see in the way. Now, to, to get this, I want you to think about a trapeze artist. You know, so a, a trapeze artist is, you know, they, they cannot move on and do the trick until they let go of the trapeze. Can you imagine how boring a, a circus act would be if all they did was hold on to the trapeze time and time and time again? Now, see, they, they make it that way because they know that they have to burn that bridge before they can make the next step. Uh, you know, and then to make sure that they don't fall, they can also, uh, lock it in and burn it even more by removing the safety net. You know, a lot of us have tons and tons of safety nets around every single action that we take. I want to make this very clear. Every time that, that you make a commitment to somebody and you say, well, I think I can or you know or I might or anything like that you realize that you just put yourself up a safety net it's it's not a real commitment uh, anybody that knows anything about commitment can see straight through that if I, if I'm dealing with a patient and they say well you know yeah I'm, I'm working on it baloney Working on it doesn't work. You know, hey, yeah, you know, are you doing your therapies? Well, I'm working on it. You know, if you're one of those that say that, it's baloney. I'm calling it right now. You know, so we know what that means. It means that you built a bridge and you're allowing yourself a return point. You've got to commit to things to, to the point where you know that there is no bridge that you can cross backwards in order to, in order to get out of, of, uh, you know, remaining committed to that. So, the next thing is take immediate action towards it. You, you know, if, if a goal is not worthy of taking a step towards it, then why even bother set the goal? You know, but how many times do we say, well, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But then we sit back and we wait a couple weeks to make an, uh, to make an action step. For example, a couple weeks ago was Christmas and, you know, a lot of people say, uh, well, I'm going to lose weight after Christmas. And you know what that means? That means you're not committed to it. Because if you were committed to it, you wouldn't wait until after Christmas. You'd be doing it right now. So, you know, take an immediate action step towards it. I, and I'm talking right now. 
If, if you're listening to this right now and you know what that goal is, hit the pause button, take a step towards it. If you're in your car, obviously most of you are going to be in your car listening to this, pull off on the side of the road. It'll be okay. Wherever you're going can wait for your goals. You're worth it. Pull off the side of the road, hit the pause button, and make that phone call, write down the note, whatever it needs to be done to take that immediate action step. And I'm not kidding there. If, if you're still driving and you know what it is that you need to do, pull off. Not a joke. Okay, do it right now. So next thing, now that you've come back, and uh, I know that you just paused it. I know that you just did what you had to. Otherwise, you're feeling like a big fat failure right now uh, be, by not doing that. And you still have a chance to redeem yourself. You can pause us at any time. But now you want to have relentless discipline. No excuses, period. You, you've got to have it to where you have zero excuses. You can't allow yourself to have that excuse anymore. It is not excusable. BJ Palmer, the founder of Chiropractic, said, Following the path of least resistance makes men like rivers crooked. Meaning that rivers always look for the, the path of least resistance, a loosest dirt, the place where there's no rocks, the place where there's nothing that gets in the way that would be difficult to go around and it always cuts its way through the, the most, uh, non-resistant areas. You know, but unfortunately as human beings, we're not built that way. We're built to find the resistance, bury through it, and, and, a, and a chain, uh, achieve a level of credibility, a level of character that we would not have had before we went through that resistance. So you should be looking for resistance knowing that there is nothing that can be stopped. Think like a Marine on this one. Okay, so after going through that, now that you know really how to set those goals, the ultimate question really comes down to, uh, do your goals really matter? You know, are, are they something that, that are going to affect your life or have you kind of gotten caught up on things that, that, uh, for example, are material? If your goals are material, you know, just like, Hey, you know what? I'd like to have a new car. Well, what does that really, you know, what does that car really do for you? Does, does it do anything? Is it, is it going to do anything to change the world, you know, by, by getting a new car? And usually what I find is that when goals are simply material, that they just don't really last because you're, you're not, I mean, it's, it's like it's not enough of a drive. It's not on that spiritual, deep, uh, fundamental level. So, you know, they, they get lost. They get changed really quick, you know, and, and you just, they're hard to stay on to because, of course, materials are always changing, but ideals are not. Ideals never change. So, uh, you know, and that, that also goes along the lines of, are they indulgence? You know, that if your goals are, are about indulgence, you know, then you've got to be very cautious too. You know, somebody might say, well, I want to get married to a, you know, to a supermodel. Well, you know, is that, that to me sounds like that's more on the level of an indulgence. How about I want to find a wife who is the, you know, who is the, the, uh, one that completes me that is, is a match for my character and, uh, you know, and is going to make me a better person. You know, that, that would be based on an ideal, uh, not just, I want to marry someone hot. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's not too close. You know, I agree. You can find both. So good luck on that one. They, they you know, that you, you can do both on there. So what really does matter? What, what are the things that, that really do matter at the end of the day that, that, are, are going to make a difference in your life. Well, the first level is what we call fundamental needs. So the, uh, the first area would be vital components. These are the things like air and water. You know, you can't do without these. On that level too, uh, Napoleon Hill in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks a lot about psychological air, where basically, you know, you, if, if people don't understand you, if you're, if you know that you're not understood or you're not accepted, that it's almost as if psychologically you're suffocating, you know, so you need psychological air in the ability to, you know, know that you're accepted, know that you're within that comfort zone, you know, so those would all apply as what we call vital components, the things that you can't do without. The next step would be social components. These are the things like money and shelter and protection, you know, the things that 
uh, in a social setting, you need to make sure that that they're taken care of. You know, so everybody everybody needs money. You can't you can't dodge around that. You can't say that money is you know is inadequate or you know that you don't need it. Try that for about a month and see how you do. You know, money is absolutely critical to not only yourself, but it's it's also critical to make anything happen. You know that for most endeavors these days, you have to have some level of financial backing in order to get anything valid going. So uh, you also need to have shelter, you know, and, and protection. These things, you know, just to make sure that that you're you're not going uh, to be in danger at any moment. And that also leads into the emergency components. You know, the things that it may not be a vital or social. Um, Emergency, but you know these these other things that if you don't handle them right now, if if you don't handle that situation, whatever it is, that you're not going to be able to function past this point with 100% effectiveness. You know, so those would all be fundamental needs. You know, the things that 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 do really matter. You have to take care of those up front. So I don't. I, I want to clarify that because you can't really move on to the other levels until those fundamental needs are taken care of. Okay, so the next thing in what really matters would be what I would term as relational or impactual. You know, uh, a good example of this would be actually we'll use two two uh, very good examples for this. Number one would be Gandhi. Uh, you know that that Gandhi, though he did not have a lot of resources. He made uh, lots of of real connections in the world. He got a lot of people to follow him, and he made a huge, huge impact on on. I mean, we're talking millions of people simply because he was focused on what really mattered in terms of relational and people. Uh, likewise, probably the greatest of all time, uh, arguably the greatest of all time, would be Jesus. That. Jesus worked on relationships that, uh, you know, even in his sense, I don't believe, you know, carried along a a large sack, a large money sack. Um, He simply focused on relational and impactual and his needs were, of course, met. You know, but the ultimate uh, point to that is he made huge impacts on many, many, many people and continues to do so today in the millions because of his focus, relentless focus on people, on love, on sharing, on giving, you know, the things that that ultimately matter in the terms of relational and impactual. So are your goals on a level to where they affect other people in a positive way or are they self-serving? Self-serving usually doesn't last very long, or at least uh, we know it doesn't last in the long term. And then the the next step would be what we call a uh, personal endurance you know and and for the for the sake of health and where all this wraps in and applies um th- this is where it really comes down to because in terms of personal endurance nothing else really matters outside of your health uh the reason i say that is because it's your only physical possession when you really think about it and you put everything together you can do nothing without your physical body. Not only that, if if you can't do anything without your physical body, you also have to sit back and look at, well, if there's only one thing on the entire planet that only I can possess, it's your physical body. You know that money can be taken, cars can be taken, homes can be taken, 401ks can be taken, but your body is yours exclusively from the day you're born until the day that you die. You know, so it really ultimately is the one thing that has been gifted to you to take care of. Now, why is this so important, you know, then to take up, take care of your health? Because number one, it quantifies your time. Okay. It quantifies the amount of time that you're going to be able to live. Uh, if you don't take care of your health, everybody knows it's a, it's a common principle. If you trash your health, you're going to lose some time because when you die early, you definitely lose time. You know, so how much time do you think you were given uh, in the beginning and how much time do you think you are actually going to end up with and whose fault is that? You know, ultimately, it comes down to our decisions throughout our lifetime as far as 
how much time we have with the exception of traumatic incidents. You know, we, uh, we, we all know that those happen and there's nothing that we can do about that. But for the most part, we do quantify our own time for the, you know, for the great, uh, majority of instances, uh, in, in relevance to most of us. Next thing, it quantifies your money. Okay. So, you know, if you have, let, let's say that you are uh, 20 years old and you're incredibly overweight and you're already having signs of heart disease. You get to work for about 10 years and then you end up having to have bypass surgery at 30 years old. You know, can you see how that's going to quantify, quantifiably impact the amount of time that you're going to be able to be in the workforce making money? Obviously, you can see in that example it does. But, you know, a lot of us have this, you know, this notion that, well, 65 is retirement, so I just have to make it till 65. Well, what if for you, your 65 was actually 75? You know, that, that you were in the, in better shape than most 65 year olds at 75. Could you not feasibly work for an extra 10 years? In fact, uh, anybody that, that I've ever uh, listened to as far as financial coaches, they've all said the same thing, that, that uh, retirement should not be a word in your vocabulary, that you should be productive as long as you can stay productive. Our, uh, Jim Rohn, is, uh, you know, in, in one of his series, says that, uh, that we give up the most amount of uh, or the best years of our working life after retirement, that most of us season ourselves and we build our character and we build our abilities and our on our intelligence. Our entire life, we're working on these things, and uh, we we would have a good solid ten years from sixty five to seventy five at least, where we're incredibly productive. Yet we give that up and we're not driving it towards. Can you imagine if every single person? in the last 100 years in this country had put in a solid extra 10 years from 65 to 75 in the workforce. You know, where we might be in technology, where we might be in business, where we might be in in leadership and law, you know, that we would be just strides ahead if we had really paid attention to those ideals up front. So it definitely quantifies your money and the amount that you're going to be able to make in the long run. You also don't get paid very well on sick days. I think you'd agree there. So the next thing, it quantifies your energy. You know, and that, that goes along the lines of time, but not necessarily. I've, I've seen a lot of people who, you know, they, they have the time because they're still alive, but they spend 10 years in a hospital. Uh, my grandfather spent, uh, I, I believe about 18 years in a lazy boy chair. So that was not a very good uh, uh, quantification of energy. Uh, though he had the time, it was unfortunately spent watching lots and lots of ESPN. But knowing every score that's out there doesn't really help you in the long run as far as uh, serving society and serving people and building along those lines of, of relational and impactual uh, ideals and goals. So, a uh, you know, now... What does not quantify your ability to impact, um, you know, if, if you look at Jesus, he, he lived to 33 years, you know, so I, I want to clarify this, uh, in, in the right means that, you know, your, your time and money and energy don't really quantify to a large degree your ability to impact because, you know, of course, Jesus, like I said, he, he only lived to 33 years yet he was able to impact uh, for the rest of time. You know, so that, that's a, a key uh, uh, instance of, of showing us that, that you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really affect the way that we can impact if we're really all in. You know, but for most of us who are not Jesus, uh, you know, our time, money, and energy does make a large difference in what we're going to be able to do in terms of impacting the world. So, you know, knowing all this and, and putting all this in, into solid perspective, whose hands are you placing your health in? You know, ha have you really thought about that? Who's, whose hands do you have your health in? Is it, is it in yours? Is it, do, do you put your eggs in somebody else's basket? Are you waiting for somebody else to, to take care of you? Are you counting and, and putting all your, uh, all your outcomes in the hands of somebody else? 
And if so, I'm gonna urge you with this one question, does anybody else care more about your health than you do? Think about that again. Does anybody care more about your health than you do? So, you know, if nobody else cares more about your health than you do, shouldn't your health be in your hands? You know, it's it's kind of like, you know, having your money in somebody else's hands. Is is there many other people that you can trust that you would just give them your entire lifetime's earnings and expect that they're going to do better with it than what you do with it? You know, so maybe that is, is I well, not maybe, that is not on the same level as your health. Your health is even more important because, yeah, people can do more with with your money, you know, in some in some instances that may apply, uh, but your your health is only yours. You know, nobody else can direct it. Again, it's yours indefinitely. It's the only thing that you actually have that is material. So, whose hands are you placing your health in? Uh, number one, your MD, your medical doctor. Barbara Starfield found in the Journal of the American Medical Association that 230,000 to 284,000 deaths occur each year from iatrogenic causes or physician error. Under the authority of medicine and medical care, we are now the sickest country on the entire planet. We have more chronic disease in the United States than anywhere else. We take more drugs than anywhere else. And and I purposefully say drugs because whether they're legal or illegal, they're still drugs. They are still chemicals being put into our body. You know, so you got to see it really doesn't matter if it's if it's legal or not. It's still a drug. It still has side effects. You know, so is that who you're putting your faith in is your doctor you know and on that level how much time is your doctor able to put into making sure that you're doing everything correctly you know i know in my case i take care of hundreds of patients every single week do you you know do you think it's possible that i know exactly what needs to be done with you or i'm able to put the time into knowing exactly what what needs to be done at any minute uh, think about that for a second. You know, I mean, I care deeply about my patients, but I don't have the time of the day to to you know pay as much attention to you know to you, your health as my own health. You know, I mean, they're they're on a totally different category. So you know, you've got to have your your uh, health in your own hands. You can't have it in the hands of your doctor, especially not your medical doctor, because. Uh, drugging it and cutting it and burning it out are never going to lead to a better life of health and uh, and well-being. The next one, insurance or government. You know, I I hear from time to time people wanting to put their put their healthcare decisions in the hand of what their insurance pays for. Well, your insurance company is worried about one thing, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news to this, but they are worried about their bottom line not your health, not your bottom line, their bottom line. Uh, the government really is not much different. You know, Rush Limbaugh, uh, though I may not agree with every single thing that he says, I think this was put rather eloquently. He said, Obama's health care plan will be written by a committee whose head, John Collier, says he doesn't understand it. It'll be passed by Congress that has not read it, signed by a president who smokes, funded by a treasury chief who didn't pay his taxes, overseen by a surgeon general who is obese, and financed by a country that's nearly broke, and I'd add in there nearly dead. So what could possibly go wrong? You know, the the bottom line is there, government is not going to answer our health care problems. Until we address our health as individuals, nobody can save us. You understand that? Nobody, not even me, can save you until you take control of your health yourself. You are the one in charge. Those around you can only either empower you or take power away from you. Ultimately, it's up to you. Now, what about God? You know, this this is a this is a big one too. I I hear uh, quite often. To my dismay, you know that that people place all of their their health decisions 
uh, well, at least the excuse is in God's hands, you know, that I'm going to, well, I'm, I'm just going to trust in God. I'm going to trust in God, you know, and I'm not going to disagree at all, definitely, because uh, the entire chiropractic principle is based on the ability of God, that God is working in your body to keep you healthy at any given time, that literally that life in your body is what keeps you alive, period. So the question is not, is God able? You know, he is able, he has, he has long arms, he can reach any problem, he can do anything that he wants to do, but... There's a big but here. I want to direct you to a few scriptures on this point. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of, of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? But you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, do you think that it's honoring God with your body when you blame God? Uh, all of your all of your health woes on him, and when I say blame your health woes on him, that's not much different from saying, "Well, it's not my problem." You know that God is going to sustain me. God's going to take care of all my problems. I don't have to worry about it. He's going to take care of it. You know that is not on the level of honoring God with your body. You don't honor God by shoving off the big decisions to Him. First uh, Corinthians ten thirty one goes on to say, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know, so a lot of times people look at uh, the uh, six nineteen through twenty verses as being purely sexual. Therefore, honor God with your body. You know, don't don't sleep around, don't have multiple affairs, don't you know, all all the sexual natured stuff. And I'll tell you what, again, that's nothing more than an, than an excuse. It's an excuse not to include all the things that are uncomfortable, the things that we don't want to pay attention to. It's really easy to look at that and say, oh, well, you know, I interpret it to mean this because I don't want to have, you know, because I know that I'm not going to uh, cheat on my husband or my spouse. But, oh boy, you know, I start thinking about I need to honor God with everything that I do, everything that I eat. I need to start exercising. I need to start taking immaculate care of my body. Then that sounds pretty uncomfortable. So, I don't think I'm going to include that. I'm I'm just going to uh yell blasphemy every single time that somebody says that, "Oh, you know, it's 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 more than just uh sexual sins." So, again, uh you're you are debunked right there if you're in that category because it says 1031, "So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God." Okay? Romans uh, and and I'm sorry, eating a Twinkie is not honoring God. You cannot say that your eating Twinkies are to honor God. You can try it, but but yeah, come on now. I mean, get real on this point. Uh, no, nobody's buying into that one. Eating a Twinkie is not uh, is not doing it for the glory of God. Ongoing Romans twelve one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Now, I want to go back through that, and I want to lay out something very clearly there. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. Okay? What that means is that, yes, God has mercy. He has redeemed you. He is taking care of you. But it's not about that. You're not doing it just to get by. You are doing it in view of God's mercy, in understanding that it's not maybe necessary, that it's not your life's balance hanging on the line, but you're doing it anyways. And it says in doing so in that way, by offering your body as a living sacrifice, doing everything for sacrifice in his, in his uh, view, in his full view, that is holy and pleasing to God that this is your spiritual act of worship, that you are actually worshiping God every single time that you do better for yourself, knowing in full view that, you know, that, that I am, uh, 
I'm doing this for you. A, a great example of that, you know, I may, you may not be a runner, but one of the things that I do to, to take care of myself is I run. And I've said time and time again, there is no better time that I feel that I'm really connected with God in a state of worship. I mean, I'm not, I'm talking not sitting in church, not with the bands playing and the drums beating and, and everything else. None of those other times, not even solitary prayer, but when I am running, I, you know, I'm literally in that act of sacrifice. That's when I feel like I'm the most connected. And everybody is, is different, but, but I think that's relevant to that point. Now, uh, the, this next one is just going to blow your mind. Exodus 23, 13. It says, worship the Lord your God and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you. You know, that when you go back to the one before and it says in God's, you know, in view of God's mercy, that you take care of yourself, you sacrifice for your, you know, for your life, for to take care of what was given to you, your temple, that that is a spiritual act of worship. And then it says that when you worship in that way, you know, or, or I mean, I'm sure you can say it's in a lot of other ways, but I'm sorry that that connection is not there just uh, needlessly. Worship the Lord your God. In his blessing will be on your food and your water. He will take away sickness from you. You know that when you stay in alignment with God's principles of health and healing, that sickness just bounces off of you. And this is not something that that is you know is uh, overly spiritualized or anything like that. It's plain and simple. You can look out in the world. You look at people who take better care of themselves, and guess what? He takes away sickness from you. You know that that people start changing their diet and exercising and doing the right things, and their cancer, you know, gets uh, gets gets removed from them. You know that they uh, they get away from cancer. They get away from heart disease. We see it all the time. I mean, I could give you a hundred examples. You know, of, of people who have who have personally manifested and witnessed, you know, this kind of healing. Uh, because they stayed in alignment with these principles. They, they literally honor God. Whether they believe in God or not, they're honoring God. Every time that you, you take care of yourself, you are honoring God. So, uh, we don't want to, we, we don't and never have received a role of personal irresponsibility. That's the point there. The entire point is you, you are not in a position of irresponsibility where you don't have to do anything and, and your daddy is going to take care of you. You know, you are called to be the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, I, I, whenever I read this, I think about, about the, uh, the connection with, uh, as I adjust people, you know, I, I remind you, your power's on. You know, that, that's not just some kind of catchy, uh, you know, slogan. Just, uh, something cool to say, you know, so that I don't have to say, hey, I care for you or, or getting it, you know, and just kind of that, that end note. The point is there is to really get you thinking about that. Your power is on. Your light is on. You are functional. You are healing. You are becoming more of what God made you to be every single time that you get yourself back in alignment, back into a state of function. You are, get, you are getting that much closer to your capacity. You know, so it's just incredible how it works, you know, and, and, uh, you know, too often do I see people putting it under a basket. You know, they, they hide their problems. They hide their health under a, a pile of excuses, a basket of excuses. They lay over their head and they never, they never let it out. You know, how much light could we have in this world if, if you stopped putting baskets over your problems? If you started pulling the basket off and saying, you know what? I am going to let it go. I'm going to do what it takes in order to get to that next level. So thinking of your earthly father alone, because maybe you don't connect on that level, you know, just think about your earthly father. Father, do you really honor him by being a slug? You know, if, if you're a slug and, and you don't do anything to take care of yourself, you don't do what you know you need to be doing, what you should be doing, you just rather sit on the couch all day or sit in your car or lazy boy chair and, and pile up on the excuses to not do this and not do that and, 
and you know quit this and quit that and you know anything that's good for you you know, you know you know try out for a little while and then go on to something else you know would would that honor your earthly father you know does does he look at you or or your spouse you know does does your spouse well you know what i love him but you know what i really love about him what really turns me on is when he's a slug when he doesn't do anything when he doesn't go to work when he calls in sick because he'd rather sit around and watch movies and drink beer you know uh men do you look at your wife and say wow you know what she's really hot but what I really like about her most is that she never cleans a house, that she, uh, you know, that she doesn't do the laundry, that she really would rather spend her time on the phone. Uh, you know, these are not the qualities that, that bring honor to anybody, but most importantly, they don't bring honor to ourselves, that we're not staying honorable to ourselves when they lay on these excuses. So we're tired of the excuses. You can't allow the excuses to go on in your life anymore. So through commitment, how much more would you please him? You know, if, if you really committed, how much more do you think that's going to please him than, than right now? You know, and, and again, the excuses of, of, uh, well, you know, I know that, that I'm, I know where I'm at. I know where I'm at. I know that I'm, I'm doing enough. I know that, you know, my God loves me and everything else. I get that. You know, that is true. But how much more would you please him and honor him? If you committed to the things that you know are placed in your heart to commit to, if you achieve those goals, come on, how much more can you achieve? I, I mean, if you're listening to this right now, you've got more to achieve uh, and you know it. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be listening to this right now. You would have, you would have said, well, I don't need to, you know, I don't need to learn from you. I don't need to listen to any of this. I've already, you know, I'm, I'm way beyond you. I've already done all this. I'm, you know, I'm, you, you would not be listening to it, period. End of story. So you know you could do more. Figure out what it is. Commit to it right now. Now, all of this, when you understand all of this, this leads to spiritual development. Plato, uh, you, I'm sure you've heard of Plato, and I'm not talking about the kid's toy. I'm talking about the, uh, the uh, ancient uh, scientist uh, and, or writer. I'm, I'm sure he did a lot of stuff uh, we don't give him credit for, but... The greatest mistake in the treatment of diseases is that there are physicians for the body and physicians for the soul, i.e. pastor's church, you know, although the two cannot be separated. You know, we, we've got this big separation and these are, these are really Greek ideals. Uh, you know, of course, you know, the, the Bible is written in, in Hebrew, not in Greek, but these Greek ideals have gotten grafted into the way that we look at the world and the way that we see the world. And this is so cool because, you know, they, you, you read that again, you know, and, and, and he says that, that there are physicians for the body, i.e. doctors, and there are physicians for the soul, i.e. pastors. You know, and the two really cannot be separated. If you think about it, you, we'll, we'll look at it both ways. You're, you cannot be, uh, you, you cannot be whole as a person spiritually if you don't have your physical health. You know, I, it's, there's, there's a lot of, I've, I've treated, and you know what? I just lost one here just, just a little while back. A, a, you know, just outstanding woman who had incredible zeal for, for the church and for life. Uh, you know, just awesome believer, you know, but you could just see she wasn't fulfilled. Um, it was impossible to be fulfilled because she was receiving uh, uh, dialysis, kidney dialysis all the time. It was in just really rough shape. And, you know, I often ask the question, well, you know, I, I'm just waiting for my healing. You know, I wish God would heal me. You know, it's the point being there, you know, I, and ultimately I know her healing did come. Uh, you know, she she's in a better place now. But the point is, it's really hard to be spiritual, spiritually fulfilled when your body is, is going out. You know, vice versa, uh, you know, if, if you don't have solid spiritual health, it really doesn't matter how healthy you are. You know, that there's a lot of people who they take really good care of their bodies, but they're still miserable because they don't have any level of spiritual health. You know, unfortunately, I get I get to see that quite often. Uh, may, maybe by chance, one of you listening, you know that uh, you, may, you may be listening, saying that this is me. You know, and the uh, the the point there. If you wonder what that was, that was my alarm. Uh, the uh, the point there is that you know you you can't really 
you you can't stay fulfilled in the long run if you're not spiritually fulfilled. And this is not supposed to be a spiritual uh, workshop or you know a, a church service or anything like that. That's not my job as a chiropractor or as a doctor. Uh, but at the same time, it is because as it said, you can't really separate the two. And what's so awesome about this is that uh, as a chiropractor, we get to work right in the middle of that, that we understand a principle that the power that made the body heals the body, that the body works above, down, inside out because of a powerful, innate intelligence, that power of God that literally works in our bodies to keep our cells and our tissues functioning at every given moment, that that is the power that we get to work with, that we get to turn that power on every single time. And I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that I'm not just moving a bone, that I'm not just taking pressure off a nerve, that I'm not just eliminating pain, that every single time that I lay my hands on somebody, that I am bringing them better and closer into alignment with God's principles of health and healing and and their ability to achieve their purpose in this life. I you know I I I urge you to to go back and rewind that a couple times and and think about that. You know because it just I am so honored to be able to do that for for my patients and and just knowing that there's there's hundreds of you know thousands of chiropractors out there that uh, you know unfortunately some of them don't even uh, realize what they're doing but. But that is the truth that, that you're turning that power on, that innate intelligence that allows you to function and create and, and everything else. It's just, it's so powerful. So, uh, C. Miller, uh, C. Jeff Miller said in, in addition to that, body and soul cannot be separated for the purpose of treatment, but they are one and invisible. Sick minds must be healed as well as sick bodies. You know, so again, we need to look at it as, you know, we can't just uh, undergo treatment. You know, you think about one of the reasons why really just uh, the idea of chemotherapy and radiation therapy just just eats me alive is because it robs people of their integrity. It makes them um, it makes them spiritually and psychologically sick. You cannot get somebody well by doing a treatment that breaks down your integrity as a human being. Period end of story. So, you know, uh, we, we look at the idea of the good steward in this instance. Luke twelve forty two through 44 says, and the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. You know, so the good, you know, the, you know, the, the Bible says that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that we are supposed to honor God with our bodies. And yet you look at it in light of the good steward, you know, how do you expect that, that God is really going to bless you in the areas that you'd like to be blessed in? If you are not taking care of the things that he's actually stewarded you into. So, uh, you know, and some people might bring up here, what about by his stripes we are healed? You know, that, that, uh, I, I believe that, you know, his, by his stripes, all of our, all of our inequities, all of our diseases and illnesses are healed. Well, look at Luke 12, 47 through 48. Uh, just, just moving on a couple verses from there. And that slave, uh, and that slave who knew his master's will and did not ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. Okay, think about think about the uh, the analogy. Do you think that that is you know again that these are just kind of you know randomly thrown in there? I'm sure God didn't see any kind of a connection there when he wrote the Bible. Okay, that it says by his stripes we are healed. That that we have ownership. To that healing is basically what that's saying. That that God's sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, was the means to to have acceptance of that healing. But it says, and that slave, we, me, I, you, who knew God's will, His Master's will, and did not ready or act in accord with it, will receive many lashes. 
So you're, you're basically, when you don't stay in alignment with that, when you don't act on it, when God puts a desire in your heart and you don't act on it, you're saying, well, okay, well, I'll go ahead and receive the lashes anyways. You know, uh, I guess it's worth it. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. Well, unfortunately, sorry guys, if you, if you're listening to this, it's too late. You already know. So I'm sorry I blew that one for you. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. You know, so do you really think that you can continue to ignore God's principles of health and healing, yet still receive his unlimited blessings? Uh, what, what Bible are you reading from? You know, I just... It, it blows me away the uh, the number of lies and uh, and excuses that we've bought into uh, so that we can put the blame on other factors or we can take away responsibility from ourselves. You cannot do that in 2010. It is no longer acceptable. So we were called to a higher standard, the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth meaning the that we are supposed to be here to prevent the decay of society. You know, if if you're listening to this, you you know likely are a chiropractic patient, and if you're not, you better get in uh, right away. You better you better be doing something about it because you're you bas- basically be ignoring everything that this is talking about. We were called to be the salt of the earth to prevent the decay of society. Well, you don't see any greater decay of society than what's happening in our health right now. Every little bit of our financial problems, every bit of our economic problems, it all goes back to our people are sick. When your people are sick, your country is sick. When your countries are sick, your world is sick. You know, so the church is sick. It doesn't matter where you go. There's kids sitting behind you in church that are taking ADHD medications and antidepressants. It is absolutely disgusting what's happening, going on right now. We have to be a higher standard. We are called to be the salt of the earth to prevent the decay of society. We do that by removing the decay, by starting to see life turn around, by, by expressing the principles that, that manifest in blessing. So does it sound like it was supposed to be easy? Did you forget most of the characters in the Bible were persecuted and died for their cause? Most of the great men like Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln that, that had notable deeds to, to achieve in their life, that they sacrificed all the way to their life to get these across. You know, it's never supposed to be easy. Ideals are not easy. There is no easy end to, you know, to, to get around. If you look for the path of least resistance, you end up crooked, you know, so. Uh, Matthew 5.13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So, you know, we I, I want you to just take a second here and you think about the end of your life. You know, that when you are laying in your coffin, step outside of your body and you imagine yourself laying in your coffin. This is the end. You know, this is this is the last moment. What do the people say about you? What does your family say about you? What do, what do the people that knew you best think about you? How does your legacy move on? Did you do things that were notable? Did you do things that were honorable? Can they look at you and say, I will never forget the lessons that that person taught to me? That the level of intensity, the level, the level of responsibility, that they look at you and they say, you know what, I'm going to live the rest of my life committed to the level that they were. You know, and were, did you really accomplish everything that you could have? You know, and I, my fear would be that, that you would look at this moment and say, oh my goodness, you know, that really to this point, I haven't been good for a whole lot. You know, that you might have some notable deeds and, and some things here and there that you're proud of, but did you really, are, are you really living to the level that you know that God created you to be? You know, and, and if, if not, on some level, do you feel in your heart that, that, you know, you have lost your taste, that, that you are the salt that's lost its taste. And are you going to allow that to be, uh, you know, are you going to allow yourself to be thrown out and trampled under, under people's feet and your own feet? Are your excuses going to, are, are, are they going to be 
a reason to set your goals aside and not achieve your dreams. So what health goals do you have? You know, if, if you don't have any goals, you need to have some goals for your health this year. 2010 is a year that you're going to make everything happen. So do your health goals line up with effectiveness? You know, I, I so often I hear people say, well, my health goal is I'm going to lose weight. My health goal is I'm going to, I'm going to exercise more. Well, I got news for you. A lot of skinny people die early and, uh, and a lot of people lose weight and still have heart attacks and die from cancer. So do they really line up? Do these goals really line up with effectiveness? You know, and I want to give you an example here because this really ties back into what you're going to do this year and, and what levels you're going to commit to. Uh, if, if somebody is walking down the street or, you know, and they decide that they're going to, they're going to become a cross trainer, you they're, they're going to start running every single day, but they've got 60% nerve compression go into their heart and they start running are they better off running or better off not doing anything uh, think about that they've got 60 percent compression on the nerves of their heart is their heart working at the level that it should be and if it's not working at its optimal capacity and you overshoot that capacity what happens that's right, you have a heart attack or a stroke or you have some other disaster happen. Uh, one of my colleagues over in Gulf Shores, she uh, sent me an email last week saying that she was at the YMCA and she was on her way out after working out and there was a man and she saw him trembling. She knew something was wrong so she, uh, she ran over and sure enough, right there uh, on the spot, the guy had a stroke. And they call the ambulance and she doesn't know if he's alive or not. But here's a man who I guarantee you thought that he was doing himself well by being there in the gym and working out. And this is not meant to scare you out of working out. This cannot be an excuse. You cannot listen to this and say, well, you know, I've got this heart condition. You know what? That can't be an excuse anymore. It's time to do something about it. Get rid of the excuses. The point is, You've got to take care of first things first. You've got to take care of and make sure that your, your goals are in line with effectiveness. Uh, you, you know, you see your nerve system controls every single function in your entire body. How can you function without a functioning nerve system? Uh, subluxation is when those bones rotate and they put compression on the nerves, choking them off, uh, eliminating that life from flowing above, down, inside, out the way that it's supposed to. So what happens if you cut a nerve anywhere in the body? That's right, the organs die. They they create disease, they malfunction. So how much function do you wanna maintain and what are you doing? What are you doing now? What are you gonna do this year to make sure that that is functioning at, at its optimal capacity? Is that a goal even, I mean, Maybe you're thinking, oh, well, I don't even need chiropractic. You know, I'll just, uh, I'll just go ahead and work out and, and eat right and that's going to take care of business. Good luck with that. You know, I just, the, my point here is to be upfront with you and honest with you because I want to see you achieve your goals. But without keeping first things first, it's not going to happen. You've got to be able to take care of yourself on all levels and keep yourself functioning from above down inside out. There is, there is no clearer way on, on a uh, spiritual level than I can see in why every instance that Jesus is referred to as the head and that we are referred to as the body because there's a clear cut, uh, there's, there's a clear cut underlying principle there that the that the head controls the body it works above down inside out you know it's just awesome the way that all this ties in you know so i want you to set your goals right now based on the five essentials by level of importance number one is health healing and function above down inside out optimal nerve system capacity then you know then goes in fitness then goes in nutrition and maximizing your mindset and stress reduction and everything else on that level and uh and then lastly getting rid of medications and toxins getting rid of the things that that are keeping you from living the life of health that you're that you're supposed to be uh achieving so go back through if you don't have a goal on this principle i want you to listen to this one more time go all the way back to the beginning and listen to the process about making it crystal clear making it real uh is it attainable step outside of your perceived limitations commit yourself to the point of trust make it public lock in burn every bridge and safeguard take immediate action pick up your phone right now write down the website whatever it is take immediate action now towards your goals and then have relentless discipline. Don't allow yourself to have excuses anymore. 
So uh, in closing, W. Clement Stone said, no matter how carefully you plan your goals, they will never be more than pipe dreams unless you pursue them with gusto. You know that I think that's what God wants most out of our lives is that we pursue it with gusto, that we pursue him with gusto, that everything is done with pizzazz, with, with uh, you know, just... Uh, you, you do it to the best level that you possibly can, that you serve and you help and you and you contribute to the best level that you possibly can. Is this going to be the year that you step up to the plate and you start doing it with gusto? Or are you going to continue to do it on the other end of the spectrum, which we call the status quo? You know, so start doing it with gusto right now. So if you know if you found this useful, I'm going to ask you. I'm talking to you, okay? That this is not obviously. I'm not talking to anybody else right now. This this is you sitting in your car. Uh, imagine I'm looking at you. I'm sitting in the seat right next to you. Not hold this to your archives and just throw it out. If you found this valuable, pass it to someone else. Give this CD to somebody else that you know that can listen to. It. If you're listening to it on your computer on MP3, forward it to somebody. You can make copies with the CD. You can do whatever you want to before you send it out. You can rip it to iTunes and your, and your iPod and all that. I don't care. You know, but the point is get it to somebody else so that it can make an impact in somebody else's life. So figure out who you're going to give it to right now. Think about that person. Put it in your plans. You know, when you pull it out, set it aside, write their name on it, whatever you need to do, give it to them. And if you're not a patient, you got this handed to you. Guess what? It still applies. Keep this thing going. If the, you know, by the time you get this, it should have scratches on it so deep that you can't even listen to the CD anymore. And if that's the case, you know, then uh, ask who gave it to you. Get in contact with us. Visit my website www.maximizedlivingdrbucknell.com, or you can call the office at two five one six zero seven zero zero four zero, and we'll get you additional information. Uh, so, in addition to that, if you want to become a maximized living testimonial of transformation this year yourself, then make sure that you call. But uh, outside of that, be sure to check and uh, get your hands on next month's audio CD. I want to thank you, and I'm just I'm just wishing so many blessings on this on this year for you. Uh, and I just want to encourage you because I know that's that's really what we need is is not just encouragement. We need somebody driving us and pushing us. So this was not meant to be too hard on you individually. Uh, if you took any offense to this, if you argue with any of it, you know that's okay. Uh, realize that usually it comes down to some level of ingrown. Uh, excuses that we've allowed ourselves to follow into. But my, my, my honest goal for you this year is that you get the most out of it as possible and I want to help you get there. So I want to thank you and just have an awesome, awesome day and uh, God bless you. We'll see you soon.